time. So I'll do that now. Okay. And we're ready to start. Okay, lovely. Um, well, I'd like to start by welcoming everybody. My name's Linda Seaborn. I'm in Tasmania. And, um, I, uh, energy cooperatives and um, energy community organisations are fairly new to me, but I have a long history with the cooperative sector uh, in Tasmania and across Australia. And I'd just like to start by um, acknowledging the um, Aboriginal traditional owners of the various um, lands that we're all on and to acknowledge that they've never ceded sovereignty and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, now we've got, I'm not quite sure where everyone's from, we've got people from maybe all over the place, but our presenters today are um, Tom Knockholds and Kevin Cox, and I believe we're gonna be joined later by Mike Dowson. Um, Tom is from the Pingala um, Community en Energy Cooperative and the Coalition for Community Energy. And um, sounds fascinating with the huge amount of experience that he's got. Um, six years ago, he left a corporate career to pursue something more meaningful and has become an expert in the um, different models of community energy. Um, and Joining Tom is Kevin, who he collaborates with, and Kevin Cox is from White Label Personal Clouds. Kevin's background is as a technologist, using technology to assist groups of people to work together to achieve common goals. And Mike is with us now, great. And Mike's from Unity Sparks, and he's keen to progress these concepts around collaborating and working together in the housing sector, which you'll see where that fits in after we've been through the presentation. So I'll hand over now to Tom to uh, take us through the presentation. And then at the end of that, we'll have a Q and A session. Over to you, Tom. Okay, thank you so much, Linda. Um, uh, really, really appreciate, and, and everybody for joining us. I'd like to, I guess, underscore your recognition of traditional custodians. Um, I think it's so important to, to acknowledge that uh, sovereignty was, ne was never ceded. Um, I'm just uh, playing catch up on a few technical things here and I'm just about to promote Mike to a panelist. So I'll just do that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what, what are we doing here today? Um, so, yep, thank you for the introduction. Um, uh, I guess I'm, I'm speaking today as, as part of uh, Pingala. Um, we've been collaborating with uh, White Label Personal Clouds with Kevin um, for, for, for the last well, 12 months, actually. Um, in, in fact, it was at a, at a conference uh, a year ago that we just attended again. So it is a, is a year later. And, um, uh, I guess by way of introduction, uh, Pingala is a community energy group based in Sydney. Um, we were formed five and a half years ago when a, a, a small group of about 20 people came together with a shared vision for making fairer energy and I guess a, an understanding that there was something fundamentally wrong with our old energy system. And so we set out on a journey um, to, to, to deliver fairer energy. One of the first things we did is we installed solar panels on the roof of a craft brewery in Newtown called Young Henry's. Um, and we invited the local residents to invest in that. So we think we can make fairer energy by bringing people closer together. And that's, that, that's obviously what we did with that, with that project. Um, uh, and uh, what that project did for us is it gave us a really big boost in, in terms of the profile and reputation. Um, and so what we've been working on more recently is, is a more expanded, more ambitious program of works, including developing solar gardens uh, and including developing th this concept, uh, which we'll be presenting on, on tonight. Um, we've just got to the point where I'm gonna hand over from Kevin and he's, oh, he's back, okay, that's great. Um, Kevin, do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Uh, yes, um, Tom. I'm, uh, as I say, I'm a technologist. So we have a small company called White Label Personal Clouds. And uh, my particular interest is in 
ways in which we can um, we can communicate better together as as uh, as people, and um, uh, so I've been working on this for quite a long time, and in particular in the area of uh, of identification um, of electronic identification of people, so that people small groups of people can uh, work together to to prove who they are, but. Um, and the same same ideas can be applied to a whole series of other areas, and um, and we'll see one of them today. Excellent. We'll um we'll leave the introduction to Mike towards the end because he's going to play a role more 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 at the end. But what we're here to talk to you about today is um uh, has been given the name pre power co-ops. Um, will become apparent why we've given it that name, but the the concept is relatively simple. It's, it's about placing consumers in control of their own energy assets. We find it quite um, uh, confusing that uh, energy consumers have become so disenfranchised in Australia's energy system when without the energy consumers, that there, there would not be any sort of energy system. Um, so we're really trying to put local people in control. Um, and what this project is, one, one way to describe it is it's, it's very similar to a, a franchise model. So we're, we're kind of developing a, an, an inter, in, interconnected ecosystem of local energy co-ops. Um, uh, and if we think about what, what a franchise looks like, or what a franchise does for you, um, it makes it really easy for people to set up and, and, and operate a, a business. So imagine if you wanted to open up a, a sandwich shop in your local area, you could um, register a, a business name, uh, you hire a graphic designer to come up with your graphic design. You could so sort out all of your supply chain, what your menu is going to be, rent premises, um, sort out all of your business processes and do that all yourself, or you could simply become a Subway, Subway franchise holder. So similarly, think if you, want, if you or, and a couple of your neighbours want to really like this idea that you could own and operate and consume energy locally, then the idea behind PrePower is it'll make it really easy for you to set that up and to operate it over time. So it's not about taking control away from those people, it's about making it easier for them to have their own, um, their own assets controlled by them locally. Um, we think it's really important to keep these, the, the, these um, co-ops um, uh, limited in their size, and partly that's because it means that everybody knows each other and we think social this so, concept of being socially connected is really important um, uh, and I guess one way of, another way of thinking about it is that for those of you who are sort of in the cooperative space we, we think what we're building here could be described as Australia's first platform co-op for, for the energy sector and very briefly platform co-ops is really a new movement which is intended to be a counter to the global platform, uh, corporate platform, uh, that platforms that are emerging and potentially doing a lot of damage in our communities, um, platforms like uh, Uber um, and uh, Airtasker and and so forth. So um, we're going to use a few slides like this uh, throughout the presentation. They, we call them validation slides. Um, so let me explain how they work. Um, we were um, developing the concepts uh, through, through, through the beginning of last year, the beginning of the year, sorry, and um, we were sort of thinking the way this is going to work is if we get tens of thousands of households, um, uh, we think we can offer at least 30% off energy bills and, and households don't have to pay for the solar installation. And then, lo and behold, we see Elon Musk standing up there with the, the then Premier of South Australia, Jay Weatherall, to announce that they were going to be doing this as, as an election promise, installing free solar and batteries into 50,000 households. And it sounded very similar to what we're doing. Um, and so we take that as, as a big validation that, 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 that this idea's time has come. 
Um, but there's uh, some key differences between this and what we're, what we're doing. So the, the outcome or the result uh, for that, that South Australian deal is likely to be that the assets are privately owned, um, not, really no opportunity for locals to invest and, and, and got big backing by the government. Um, now, this is a bit of a theme. Uh, the space that, that, that we're entering here um, is very crowded um, and uh, it feels a bit like there's a bit of a land grab going on at the moment. In, in fact, it's not a land grab, it, it's a roof grab. Um, any number of corporate players are getting into offering households um, free solar and batteries and um, uh, an opportunity to participate in the energy market in new and inventive ways. And uh, we're pretty sure we know why there's so many people rushing into that space. It's because they want to um, uh, have a slice of the energy bills that those customers are paying. They want to extract value out of those communities. So um, just to set the scene as we go through the presentation, um, I just want to get a couple of con concepts uh, across. For some people on the line, this is obviously really basic stuff, but but I think it's important. If we think about a company and a corporate uh, relationship and the way it works, um, what we have, let me just explain what these boxes, these parts of the diagram are. What we have is um, we'll have a productive asset. That's what this cog is. And then we'll have a supplier who owns and controls that productive asset. And then we have a customer. Now, the customer can only see the price that the supplier offers them. They can't see that productive asset. Um, they can't see how much it costs, how much it costs to operate. They just have to rely on the supplier giving them the best price. And the theory goes that if we have efficiently operating markets, and so there's multiple suppliers with multiple productive assets and lots of customers, then the suppliers will be, will be competing with each other and we'll offer a very low price, the lowest possible price, and we have efficiency driven in, in, in it. But unfortunately, what, what we're probably facing as a reality here is we've got what's known as market failure. This market competition piece is not working, and I think it's not much of a stretch to say that that's the case in the energy market right now. And evidence of that is currently being played out on our television screens each night on the news. Now, the alternative to that is a cooperative relationship. And in these cooperative relationships, we actually don't have we kind of have a supplier. What we have is a bunch of consumers who collectively own and operate productive assets. And so it completely changes the dynamic. It means that people are working collaboratively to make sure that that productive asset is working as efficiently as possible to give them the best price and the best product that they want. So that's kind of what we're what we're working on here, we're working on a, on, a, on a cooperative model for local ownership of energy assets. Um, and just going back to invoking that idea of, uh, of a franchise model, we're, we're creating an ecosystem. Um, and where we're starting is um, uh, Kevin's company is, is providing us, we'll get into detail on all of this stuff, but Kevin's company is providing us with the information system technology platform. Uh, why enable personal clouds? Um, free power, kind of, this is the work that Pingala is doing, is packaging that up into that sort of franchise model to make it really easy to do the administration, the day to day systems and processes. And then we've got the first example of a local energy co op um, currently being set up in, in Canberra. And then what's not shown here, but at the top of here is going to be dozens, hundreds of households in each one of those uh, local energy co-ops. And there'll be lots of local energy co-ops. We're starting here with electricity, but we think in the future there's opportunities to do this in other areas, uh, sort of as, as illustrated there. Um, now, uh, Kevin, do you have anything to add at that point? Are you happy to make, keep, keep rolling on? I think it's important, Tom, to realise that pre-power proprietary limited and white label personal cloud proprietary limited Will, will morph into co-ops. We've just done it this way yep. at the moment because that's, it's easiest to create companies than it is to create co-ops. Yep. Very pragmatic reasons, that's right. But the first co-op we've created is a co-op. It makes sense to do that. Um, 
So here's another validation, and I'm just going to um, play, play this short clip of this video. Now, for those of you who don't know, Kate Rayworth is uh, an, an economist uh, and an academic, and she's, uh, I, get, I, get, I think her self-description is a renegade economist. So she's part of a global movement starting in the sort of student space who are railing against the entrenched ideas that have been dominant in economic theory for far too long and arguably have become quite outdated. And you watch, watch a thinker like this emerge and you start to see their, their stories appear in, in, your, in your radio and podcast streams, then you'll see them doing a, perhaps a presentation on a, on a TEDx, a local version of a TED talk, and then ultimately you'll see them doing a, a, a full-blown TED presentation. And Kate, um, spoke at the New Economy Network Australia conference last year, where Kevin and I, uh, Kevin and I met, and shortly afterwards she did her TED talk. So I'm just going to play this little clip because what it tells us is there's some really big um, thinkers who are thinking beyond the current ep economic framework um, that is exactly the same line of thinking as, as what we're working on. So hopefully the technology is going to work on me here. We did do a test on this, and hopefully it's going to play in your screens with, with, with audio. Um, we'll just make sure that's going to work. Uh, and if I click that, it's going to open up a new browser window. And open up Kate's lovely talk. We'll leave uh, Kate at that point with those lovely words. And, and, and I guess what it illustrates is the sort of um, inspiration that we're bringing um, to this project. So the rest of this presentation, um, which we'll uh, try and complete in about 20 minutes, is going to be focused on three key, three key areas. Um, we've got a, a, a fascinating and, and I think globally cutting edge information systems platform that, that Kevin has been developing. Um, and on that, we'll be placing a, a, a completely new way of financing infrastructure, um, which leads to a very interesting governance challenge. So uh, we'll better keep moving. Um, Kevin, I think this is probably a bit that would be best if, if you led. Um, I'll, I'll let you just say next when you want me to progress slides. Uh, actually, Tom, I, I think you did a pretty good job of it last time, so I'd prefer <laughs> you to do it. <laughs> okay, great. So Kevin's company has been, um, uh, well, Kevin has been developing his concepts for his entire working career, as it turns out. Um, and so what, what we're uh, dealing with is a, is a completely new way of structuring our information systems. Actually, it's not completely new because it actually already exists. Um, but one way to describe it is to say that it's a little bit like blockchain, but it's not blockchain. Um, and by that I mean, we often, talk, we often hear people talking about blockchain as being a, a ledger which has been distributed. Um, but I would argue that it's been somewhat distributed because what, we, what blockchain has actually done is it's taken siloed, centralised databases of, of information that have been sitting behind, say, corporate firewalls, and it's moved them out, out from the corporate firewall into several key locations around the internet by using clever cryptographic techniques. And that's opened up a world of potential and possibility, but it's also come with some constraints. And it's really taking a bit of the old, the old fashioned view of the way we build information systems. Um, and it still has the same constraints uh, that the old system has. So this is a little bit what the old system looks like. So um, when, when, you, when you store data in, in a database, the way it works is you, you have an application and it says, all right, here's, here's a bit of information, um, variable name. Please store this in your database in the field name. Um, and that used to make sense when um, computers were expensive and, and, and applications and databases were very small. Um, but the problem with this arrangement is that as, as um, IT systems get more and more complicated, um, the cost to run them and to maintain them grows exponentially. So the processing power required to, to, to run them 
uh, uh, grows e exponentially. Um, you probably should add something at this point, Kevin. What can you flesh out that I haven't really explained very well? Um, yeah, the, the, the what we've done, and it's, it's happened because of the way in which technology is developed, is that what we've done is we've put um, meaning onto symbols um, rather than keeping the meaning associated with the actions when the symbols are used. So uh, we say that <laughs> we say that um, uh, John Smith is is a person's name, and we say that bit of data over there that says John Smith means John Smith. That's what it means. But it really doesn't mean John Smith until we actually use it as as to identify John Smith. So by 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 taking away the meaning from the actual data, then that seems to make for lots of efficiencies. But in practice, it makes it quite difficult because when you actually want to do something, you actually have to put the real meaning back on the data itself. And that becomes really, really expensive. And it becomes very, very expensive when the, when the data is, is money, when, the, when we've got symbols that represent value. And then now what we've done is isolate the reason for the value from the symbol. And that leads to all sorts of inefficiencies and, and great problems associated with it. And that's, that's the essential idea. Okay, so essentially what we're saying is, um, well, well, I guess my extension to your point there is that this, this is a much more, this new system, um, which is actually the old system, is much more like um, the way the world works, in the way the world really actually works, both, both in nature, but also in our brains as well. Um, it's not like our brains have databases and tables and we have a field called name and when I see someone's shape that I recognize I'm able to recall that it doesn't work that way it's it's because I've seen that person that my brain is able to use the data and it's through the use of the data that the, the, the meaning takes place just underscoring what Kevin said now turns out that um, Kevin's actually already developed something which which capitalizes on these exact characteristics. Do you want me to kick off on the explanation of what you did with uh, identity, Kevin, and you fill in the blanks? Uh, yes, yes, please. Yep. So here's how you, the, Kev, Kevin's already uh, been centrally involved, in fact, created a company that, that was using these techniques to prove, so prove people's identity electronically and so the old method of doing that was to ask people to send in their documents like their birth certificates and their, their passports um, and then to build up those hundred points by gaining confidence that those documents are legitimate documents but in fact what you've actually proved through that process is that the documents were legitimate and it's very disconnected from the person whose identity you're actually proving now, in the real world, if we want to prove someone's identity, um, we go through a very different process. When I say the real world, I mean in, in, the, in a social sense. If I meet someone who's na na who, I, who I don't know before, I, I simply ask them what their name is. And, 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 I'll, and, I'll, and I'll ask them and they'll, and they'll tell me their name is Kevin. And if, that, that, if the level of interaction we need to have with each other that that is that is enough of a level of security um, for the interaction, then we'll be able to go ahead and have that interaction. Um, but if um, if we need if I if I need to have a greater level of certainty that Kevin is who he says he is and that he's reputable, what do I do? Well, I don't ask him to provide a hundred points of ID. I'll find someone in my network that I already know and trust to vouch that Kevin is who he says he is and that he is reputable. And if I need multiple people to do that, I'll do that. And now imagine that idea powered by information systems, by computers. Um, it's not laborious, it's not, it's not a difficult process. We can rapidly find hundreds of touch points in my network that, that are able to prove that Kevin is who he says he is. How much of a hash have I made of explaining your technology there, Kevin? <laughs> 
That's <laughs> much, much better than I could possibly have done it. <laughs> Anything to add, though, I, I suppose? Yeah. No, it's just that um, um, <laughs> it's um, it, it, the principles that's been used, most people actually in Australia probably have been identified, if you've been identified to a bank or a, a betting society or so forth, then um, um, then you've done it this way. But the important thing is that we actually have proved that this this approach to things actually works um, in practice. So, okay. Now we're we're not talking about proving your identity. We're talking about running running the information systems to support a consumer owned peer to peer um, energy platform, and and so. Uh, th think about that. That the idea is that we're not we're not dependent anymore on storing the information in, in a centralised siloed database that is expensive to operate. Um, instead, it's the use of the data that, that gives the data the meaning. Now, um, that means that we have the potential to um, bring all the data under the control of the individual. So we think what it's going to look like. Is um, uh, Paul Boundy's just raised his hand now, Paul? If you've got a question, or you might, might want to use the chat channel because I really didn't know what to do about you raising your hand. Unfortunately, it's a piece of the technology I don't really know. Um, so we can basically um, install an app on your phone, and that phone will contain all the data relevant to you about pre-power, and you control it. Nobody else has access to it unless you give them access. And it, and it has all the information about the interactions that you've had with the co-op and the other members of the co-op. So um, we think there's two, at least two, very interesting projects out there that that are that are telling us that we're not the only people heading along this way. Solid is a project that's being, I guess, led, uh, spearhead, by, spearheaded by uh, the so-called inventor of the internet, Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and what he's doing is, we think what he's doing is, is taking these concepts and applying them to the networking layer of the way the internet works, with the promise that can, the internet users can be in control of their own information. It's quite a um, quite a compelling promise, uh, and I hope they're able to deliver that. Holochain, despite its name, we, we're pretty confident that it's not a blockchain solution. It is actually doing exactly the same sorts of techniques um, that we're working on. We don't take that as a discouragement. We take that as, as a validation. And, and we would make a point that there needs to be multiple organisations working on these technologies because these technologies are really going to underpin the future of the way our economic systems work, we, we believe. Okay, so that's the first part. That's the information systems platform. Um, we'll take questions at the end. Um, so maybe start thinking about familiarizing yourselves with the Q&A panel, um, and you can even get your questions in early if you want to. So the second part of this is uh, uh, th this, this platform of technology uh, allows us to completely rethink the way we're financing infrastructure. Um, so the first concept is uh, that that once you, get a, once you get your head around it, it's pretty easy to understand that um, renting money is expensive. Why is renting money important? Because at the moment, the, the, only, the only sort of conventional way of funding long-lived infrastructure is to use equity or, or debt. And but both, both of those ways of financing infrastructure mean that interest is being charged on the use of the money. And we're calling that renting money, because really you're just saying to someone, oh, let me use your money and I'll pay you rent for it. Um, now, this is particularly important for long-lived infrastructure because interest can easily double the cost. And in the energy space, that money leaves our communities uh, because in your suburb, in your town, uh, AGL, Energy Australia, Origin Energy, or whoever your retailer is, they're, they're not based in your town. Um, so, if we think that if we can get rid of the cost of renting money, we can we can save a lot of money. Um, I might get you to talk to these last two points, Kevin, just briefly. Yeah, just to illustrate um, how much we can save, effectively, simply by changing the way in which we do the funding, we believe that um, uh, the consumers in the ACT will pay 15 cents per kilowatt hour, as opposed to 
well, you're never quite sure how much people are charging you, but um, it's between about 22 cents and 50, 25 cents at the moment from the retailers. And at the same time, investors, um, people who put money in, and we'll see how they do that in just a moment, will get a, 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 the equivalent of a 9% fixed annuity, which is about double what you get from Challenger. And it's probably three or four times what you'll get from a allocated pension um, if you use um, from superannuation funds. All right, hang on. So what are we, what are we actually doing here? Just, just to make this really clear, we're talking about people joining a local energy co-op that they themselves have, have been involved in establishing. And then the co-op will install solar panels and batteries into the members' households free of charge. And this is the price that they will pay for electricity. Not 25, 26 cents a kilowatt hour, but 15. Um, and investors will, will be getting a very good return on investment. Um, the reason for that is really simple. It's because um, if we charge interest, let's imagine we were charging 5% interest. 5% is also, also known as 1 20th. And solar panels last at least 20 years. They're usually warranted for 25. So 1 20th, 20 times is another hole. We've doubled the cost. And instead of paying that money, we can actually offer that as a discount. The fundamental idea behind this really unique way of, um, of funding infrastructure, how do we actually do it? Well, we pre-sell the electricity that the solar panels are going to produce. So what we're doing is we're allowing customers and the people that the customers know, uh, other community members, to invest. So we're, we're taking the idea of pre-selling something. We're all a little bit familiar with pre-selling because we buy internet services, uh, you know, subscriptions, and we're often offered a discount when we buy them in advance. And there's other forms of pre-selling that exist out there. But the important thing is it's not debt and it's not equity. Um, it does create a liability to supply the product, and it does fit under the existing accounting frameworks um, seamlessly, um, what pre-selling pre looks like from an accounting perspective um, is, um, is, is, as I mentioned there, it creates that liability. But instead of being um, payment in arrears, which we're kind of all very familiar, there's this, there's this opposite concept in the accounting world, which is payment in advance. And so it all fits under the current accounting frameworks. So instead of it being instead of the return of investment being uh, a percent of it, uh, of the uh, dollar amount, what we offer as a return on investment is the electricity that's produced, and we offer that electricity at a deeply discounted price. Anything to add, Kevin? No, no, that's fine. Cool. All right, we'll get, no doubt we're gonna have questions, so we'll get through this pretty quickly. Um, last piece, the third piece of the puzzle here is um, uh, we, we think that uh, we've got a pretty interesting governance uh, challenge on our hands, not so much now, but potentially um, in the future. Um, uh, and so just refreshing what we're doing here, we're creating an, an, a national interconnected ecosystem of, of local energy co-ops that's gonna be uh, if we if we achieve our, if we achieve our goals, there's going to be dozens of, of these. Um, uh, there's going to be there's going to be dozens of these um, uh, in the energy space, and then when that's successful, we'll actually start to see uh, this idea expanding out into other areas, such as water and homes. And uh, what we think it might start to look like is a little bit like this. It becomes a very complex interconnected ecosystem. Um, and going back to my example of, of, of Subway, imagine if Subway was a consumer-owned co-op like what we're building here. And every year, all of the members needed to vote on electing a new board, or there were substantial decisions to be made. How on earth would you have an effective governance model? It's a bit right, right, like running an election for a country. Um, and so we're, 
not really tackling this challenge head on at the moment, but we are very conscious and mindful um, that we need to be thinking about it and building it in um, from, the, from the, the beginning stages. We need to make sure that customers and suppliers are being considered, that in, investors and workers uh, are also being considered, and for that matter, um, the broader interests of, of the community uh, are being considered. And I guess one of the, um, one of the interesting ideas um, that has occurred to us is, um, uh, come, I guess, partly coming out of um, the, some of the research that we've done, um, we've been researching how, do you, how, do, how does governance of large cooperatives work. Um, there's not a massive amount of information out there, to be honest. But thankfully, a very recent publication coming out of the UK, from Cooperatives UK, written by Professor Johnston Birchall, um, seems to be one of the best documents available. And it's, and it's less than a year old, I believe. Um, now, there's a lot in this publication, but uh, one of the things that I take out of it is this fundamental principles that really what you're looking for in large cooperative governance. So we're talking about governance as being just as, as in the sense of how do you have a well-functioning board who are properly um, fulfilling the functions of a board. So scanning for strategically for threats and opportunities and uh, running the compliance of the organization and so forth. And they really distill it down to these three key elements that you need to achieve. You need to make sure that you've got proper representation on the board, that the broad voices of the membership is being heard, and that there is expertise on the board. Now, we're working here in, in the in, in community energy space, the cooperative space, and the new economy space, now, simultaneously, there's a bunch of people who are realizing this and fund well, we're realizing there's fundamental problems with the way our economies are structured. There are other people, um, perhaps some of them are on the call, who are realizing there's fundamental problems with the way our democracy is working. And they include people like Brett Hennig from the Sortition Foundation in Australia um, and the amazing people at um, the New Democracy Foundation um, in Australia. Um, and one of the messages that seems to be coming through really clearly right now, and this is in relation to democratic systems, so elected representatives in states, not businesses, um, is that we don't necessarily need to have experts on top. What we can do is we can use some, some new democracy techniques, actually it's not new, they're very old, um, to um, bring the voice, sorry, br br bring the experts in to the regular people. And regular people have an amazing cap capacity to make sensible decisions. What they need to be given is an opportunity to deliberate and have that expertise so they can make those decisions. So, the specific technique we're referring to here is citizen juries. It's got a technical name, which is sortition. And really what it says is that we can actually randomly select people from amongst the membership, the population. And if they're given the opportunity to deliberate on the big issues that's facing an organisation and they're given access to expertise, then the evidence from all the trials that are being run is that they will always make sensible decisions. So if we remove experts out of the board and we simply put them on tap at, at available, what we've potentially done is we're simplifying the governance model. It's just an idea at this stage, but that's part of what we're doing to sort of tackle this challenge. So that's a recap on what we just talked about. Um, and uh, uh, I guess we get to questions. So the only way we can really ask questions is through the Q&A panel. Um, I think, Linda, you're going to try and facilitate this. Bit. Is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um, Great. And we've got a um, question here from Luke Reed. Um, first of all, thanking you, Tom, and saying that all businesses <laughs> or co-ops face risk 
what's the security of pre-power co-op? If it fails, do the daughter co-ops fail? Are there safeguards through other network or web points? Great, probably be good for you. Go for it, Kevin, yeah. Um, it's really important to realise that each co-op, there, there aren't daughter co-ops, each co-op is completely and utterly independent. Um, the co-ops don't have to use uh, our software, they don't have to use pre-power um, uh, systems, they can be other systems in time. But the co-ops are completely autonomous and the co-ops, in terms of the security associated with power, they own, the co-ops own the batteries and the panels. And in a sense, they, more importantly, they own the customers because the customers are members of the co-op. Co and in most businesses, the most important asset that you've got are your customers. So the security of these things is actually very high because they have a lot of flexibility and they can draw on assistance from the other um, co-ops that are in the network um, to, to help them out if they get into, into severe troubles. So for example, you know, if, if there's a terrible hail, hail storm in, in, um, in Canberra and we get wiped out or something like that, then uh, it's, not, it's pretty easy to, to realise that the other co-ops can come to the rescue of um, of, of, of individual co-ops. Do you want to quickly, yeah, can you quickly share your thoughts about the, the IT platform? Because you know, one, one description for it is that it's a complex adaptive system. And, and can you just talk about how that yeah, um, emergent it, property really helps with this, this question? Yeah, you, you, it, it, each of the, each, uh, when we're on our own, as an individual, you're pretty powerless. You can't do very much. But if you can work together with one or two other people, or 30 or 40 or 100 people, you now become, you now become uh, uh, powerful. And if you can speak as one voice, then you become really, really very powerful. And, and, and each, of these, each of these entities is autonomous in the sense that in the sense that you don't have to be there. You can always leave these, these things without penalty and, and, you can, and other people can come into them as, without penalty. Um, but when you leave, you don't take away any of the, um, you get replaced by someone else effectively, rather than, rather than the, the co-op being, um, being uh, uh, um, destroyed by yeah, yeah. parts of the stuff. Yeah. So, 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 so how can a co-op you know, fail as it were, Kevin? My understanding is, is that of course, if, if all, the, all the members leave, all the customers who are the members leave, then it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller to the point where it's really not worth con continuing on. But that's not the same as a catastrophic corporate failure. Correct. And, and the, the financial backing essentially is, is the fact that you've got, you've got the panels, you've got the batteries and you've got the customers. Yep. Yeah, so we have a lot of power as customers. Go Linda. Um, so Luke, does that answer your question? I'd love to type. It might take a, it might take a few seconds to type his answer. <laughs> um, because it was a fairly complicated, we... it had three different parts to it. Um, <laughs> yep, mostly. Yeah, mostly. <laughs> yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, I had one, I was interested in um, the kind of, I don't know if hierarchy is the right word, um, but the, the co-op ping, the Pingala, the pre-power proprietary limited that's um, evolving into a cooperative, who are the members of that cooperative? Are the local energy co-ops the members, which then makes them the owners of that co-op? Can I answer that? Yeah, uh, you, so we you oh. go, Kevin. You go, Kevin. Okay. Um, the, 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 no one owns the co-ops. I mean, one, one of the, you know, co-op, the co-ops will be not-for-profits. There is no ownership in the sense that 
this little bit of the co-op is mine or this little bit of the co-op is yours. Yeah. The co-op is, is an entity. It is, it is a solid thing. So, um, uh, so you, you don't think of it along ownership lines. Um, you, you think of the batteries on your roof, for example, you, 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 it's more like you have custodianship over the things. Yeah. Custodian is exactly the right word description, I think. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's the that's that's why it works, you know, in a sense. So, who yeah. are the, I guess. Uh, you go. I, I, I just. I, I guess I just. I just flesh that out about you. Know, it's like a, it's a slightly different perspective, and not. I'm not contradicting what Kevin said at all. I completely agree with him, but in a sort of a, a governance decision making who has control over the co-op sense who owns them that way um, we, we we're currently thinking that these are consumer owned co-ops and so what that means is the houses up here yeah not on the diagram the, the houses up here own this co-op yeah this co-op along with this one this one and this one they all own this one that's this co-op along with this one this one this one they all own this one yeah yeah and, and there will be people other members of the co-op who will put in money into pre-power pingala and into money into pre-services wlpc um so they will they will operate the th systems are exactly it's a fractal type system as opposed to a hierarchy yeah i love that description fractal yeah yeah it's yeah, and think of think of Kate Rayworth's great little diagram of that hub and spoke, and then that network. This is a little bit more like a network than than, than that hub and spoke. Oops, going the wrong way. Um, I'm just wondering whether it would be good to hear from Mike about how this might apply to housing. Would you like to do that, Mike? You'd have to unmute your microphone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it took me a while, but I did figure out how to do that. In the end. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, as uh, Linda suggests, my interest is, or well, I'm, I'm, I've been a follower of uh, Kevin's work for quite a while, and um, uh, very interested to see the way it's developing uh, with Tom into the energy space. My particular interest is in how it might be applied to housing. We have a housing crisis in Australia at the moment. And uh, that uh, affects all generations of Australians. A lot of young people are struggling to get affordable housing, but there are a lot of older Australians too who are grappling with it now, especially a lot of women at risk. And uh, <coughs> the, um, the, the governments uh, don't seem to be doing too much about that. Uh, and there are very few commercial interests uh, who are taking it seriously either. So, the question I've been asking for a while is how can we restore agencies to communities themselves uh, and uh, enable people to help themselves when it comes to housing? And uh, at some point the penny dropped and I realised that this self-funding model can be applied to any situation in which there is a commitment to the ongoing consumption of a resource or service. If you think about power and pre-power in particular, what makes this system work is that we get the third parties out of the equation. Uh, institutions like banks who suck value out of these community ventures uh, merely for the fact of providing some capital at the beginning to enable set up and infrastructure and so on. Uh, by getting those third parties out of the equation, we're preserving all of the value of enterprise within the community that owns the enterprise and benefits from it. It's saving massive amounts of money over the long term, as Tom said, it doubles the cost if you if you have to get a bank to pay for your infrastructure. So that's an enormous saving. And uh, but it works because we have a, an ongoing commitment to consume the resource. We don't suddenly decide next week that we don't want any power. That's very unlikely. We're going to want to keep turning the lights on, we're going to want to keep running the stove and the fridge. So uh, in any situation where uh, the the resource or the service that we're consuming is like that, this free funding could be applied. Now, the obvious one is housing, where uh, we're going to want somewhere to live. 
uh, and it's possible to set up housing under a co-op structure as well uh, and afford different kinds of participation to different kinds of people. So, um, you know, the spectrum could cover investors, uh, uh, owner-occupiers, people renting to buy and renters uh, within uh, a co-op funding model. And uh, there's a little bit of detail to work out there because obviously the regulations that pertain to the energy sector are quite different to those that pertain to the housing sector. Regulations and constraints we've got to get around. But this stage is looking very optimistic. Like we'll be able to uh, come up with a, a model which will offer the same sorts of benefits. And when we're talking about housing, we're talking about some very big numbers as well because typically housing is much more expensive than the energy that runs the house. And there's another factor which I just want to suggest to people. Imagine then that you apply this to the other things that a household needs, such as water, waste management. Uh, there could be uh, lots of other things potentially as well. And every time you add one of those things in a cooperative form, you're leveraging the savings that you're making in all of those areas. Uh, and when we, when we look at it, uh, initial modelling suggests that we are potentially going to be able to significantly reduce the costs that people um, currently expend just to secure the basics of having a house and being able to turn the lights on and uh, uh, flush the toilet. So uh, as we develop this, we're hoping that um, uh, the, you know, the energy model is now quite uh, advanced. Um, I've got still a lot, a lot of homework to do on the housing model, but we're hoping that by next year's uh, annual conference, we'll have that, that pretty well fleshed out and ready to go as well. Thank you. That sounds very uh, comprehensive, that idea of all of the kind of inputs into a house and, and yeah, that case for saving that's made by getting that money rental out of the picture. So I'll just check if we've got any more questions. We don't. So before we wrap up, is there anyone that's got any final questions that they want to ask? Um, and while we're waiting for that, I should have done this at the beginning, but uh, but I, I, I should should particularly acknowledge the Coalition for Community Energy for inviting us to present this this webinar. So thank you very much to C4 CE, and I encourage any of you that are doing um, uh, getting involved with a local community energy project to, to to be tuned in and active in the coalition for community energy. Um, and I'd also like to acknowledge the business council of cooperatives and mutuals for um, uh, their support in. Um, bringing this webinar together and particular bringing Linda into the frame. So thank you very much for that. And thanks Linda for your time as well. Um, You're welcome. Yeah, that's enough for me. It doesn't look like we've got any more questions, does it? Can I just, uh, can you put up the last slide, Tom? Um, uh, the, 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 this one? No. Ah, uh, this one. Ah, yes. I, um, I told you to call me on it. <laughs> <laughs> If, you, if you're interested in what we're doing, then go to oneprepower.com.au and express your interest. Just give us your email effectively and you'll be on our mailing list and, um, and, we can, and you can keep informed, uh, keep informed as to what's going on. And it, you never know, you might like to join. Yeah, and just, just on that, um, with the first, the first co-op, and we're, we're, giving, we're giving the name Prepower One, the first co-op is, is being set up in Canberra, but the concept is, and the reason why we've given it that name is because we think that it's going to continue to be the, the starting co-op. So what's likely to happen is if this, when, when this is a success in Canberra, it will get to the point where there's so many people from one particular suburb that there'll be a need for them to um, hive off, swarm off and create, um, I, I don't know, Acton.prepower, and, and become a uh, suburban based uh, pre power example. So, you know, don't, don't, don't be afraid of joining pre power one. It is, it is probably where it would start for you in your community if you wanted to go down that path. Yes, and we could um, we'll even take people from, uh, from Randwick. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is where I am. Thank you. <laughs> Sounds like um, a good <laughs> Yep. Um, there's a question that's come in on us to give an update on the um, on the Four Pines project. I think we'll do that after we stop recording. Happy to do that for anybody that wants to hang around. 
Um, Joe, I oh, know, questions are coming in. Good on you, people. <laughs> Linda? Uh, yes, there's a question there from Joe. Where does the grid and the retailer power fit into this model? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, oh, you, you go ahead, John. Oh, sure, sure. Um, uh, for, for first, first of all, Pingala is really strong on this point that it's, it's not a good idea to go off grid. Um, it's very expensive for the individual household and would therefore be very expensive for the co-op, but it's also a very um, socially, um, uh, it has a major equal, equity problem built into it when lots of houses go off the grid. Now, what we're doing is we're starting with installing local energy. So um, solar panels on the roof, batteries in the garage, and that will allow us to supply a very large proportion of the household's energy needs, but not all of it. So the retailer will still be involved. And so what we're looking for is retailers to partner with um, to help us do this. Um, but but the, the, the intention is, is at least at the beginning, the, 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 the retailer will still be involved in the same way as a retailer is still involved if you've bought your own solar panel and panels and you've got them on your own roof. So I hope that answered that question. Um, one of the important principles that when you have distributed systems is that you can construct them so that the existing systems remain exactly the same. So we don't change yeah. banking. We don't change. We don't. We don't need to change banking. We don't need new regulations. We don't need new, a new Australian energy um, uh, thing. We don't have to do any of that. We just do our own little bit mm. uh, and fit in with what already exists. And you can do that when you build distributed systems. So can I just check that? Um, I thought that was really interesting. That point that you made about equity there. And you said that um, going off grid, if lots of people go off grid, it has an equity issue. Do you mean that it, it undermines the existing infrastructure in a way that disadvantages, say, people who are not members of the co-op and that you want to avoid this? Um, and I think that's what you were saying, Kev, but the, Kevin, the distributive system maintains the integrity of the existing systems. And is that about protecting people that are more vulnerable? Correct. It's, it's all about more vulnerable people. And it's, yeah. cool. it's, not, it's not the only factor, but one of the major factors in this is the way the energy market rules work. And the way those rules work is that the cost of the network is mm -hmm. smeared across all of the customers. Yeah. And so yeah. um, every, every year or whatever, the, 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 the network companies go to the regulators and say, we've got this many customers and this, many, this much cost. So therefore, we need to charge each one of the customers this much money. So when the rich and the middle class and the able pay, fall off the grid, yeah. the, the poor and the vulnerable are left behind and the cost of the network gets smeared across them. Yeah. And they're left to pay for the infrastructure while those who are able to leave have left. It's yeah. deeply unfair and it's a really bad idea. There's another yeah. point that I really want to get across. because It's actually just very undesirable. What, where we're heading towards is a much more dynamic um, uh, and active energy system. The old system where we'd have big centralised coal-fired power stations that just pumped out a lot of energy and it went one way out to our houses and businesses, that, that's gone. The new system is going to have houses producing energy, businesses producing energy, consumption rate rates going up and down. And the way it's going to work is when we have a vibrant and active energy grid. And the only way that works is when we have houses on the network. Yeah. Great. So I yep. think we have passed the time that we were going to finish. So from here, um, I guess we should wrap up for people that need to leave. But... There is the option to stick around for the update on the um, Four Pines project. Like yeah, and the only reason I think we should answer it afterwards is, is because it's, it's quite a time-limited answer and so it doesn't make sense to capture that on the recording. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll close up the formal part of the um, presentation and... Um, Thank you. Thank you very much for a really, really interesting session. I've learned a lot. I'm really glad that um, the BCCM linked me up with you and I got to be here and learn about this. It's been uh, quite inspiring. Um, there's obviously years of work that's gone into the knowledge that you've brought here.
and um, I'm sure that I speak for everybody that we yeah appreciate your time and effort and sharing this and it hope this goes on to be a very big part of Australia's energy system. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you.